There are two very famous leftovers that I want to do, and then we'll get into Parashat Toldot. And I hope to do a lot today, because this is an excellent class. Here we go. Okay, so we're going to share screen. And the very first thing I want to talk about is Shiduchim. Ah, oh, that's important. Shiduchim are important. Um, last week's Parsha, of course, we know an enormous amount of sukim were spent on Eliezer, the servant of Avraham, going back to Haran to find a shiduch or a shidduch for Yitzchak. By the way, for the record, uh, it's just amazing. I'm not going to go through everyone's shidduch, but in Avraham's situation, so many of them, if not all of them, married family. They all married family. And a lot of people throughout the generations, so Fred and I were actually just talking, about even my father, Allah Basholam's family, many of them married in the family, married, many, many married cousins for many reasons. Uh, obviously, one of the reasons is because, you know, they wanted to make sure that they knew the person. So Avraham was very big on marrying family. Let me just a second. Hi, Grandma Evelyn. How are you? Hi, Grandma Evelyn. No, she doesn't hear me. Oh, oh she waved. Okay, good to see you. Okay. Uh, yeah, so they married family. Very nice. So everybody knows the story. Everybody knows the story that Eliezer went and he went to the Be'er, he went to the well and he sees a girl, by the way, again, before I, I keep stop sharing, just an interesting concept. Three Shiduchim happened at a well, three. Eliezer found Rivka, Yaakov found Rachel. No, what's the third one who remembers? Moshe, 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 Moshe found Tzipora. So I don't know why we keep sending our children on dates. Just send them to the well, man. That's the way you get it. Just go <laughs> to the well, pick up a girl, and come home. Over. Uh, of course, the well is a siman bracha, it's a bracha, the flowing water. Fine. He comes to the well, and I, I'm, I'm not going to go through that. There's just one nekuda I want to find, and I think it's so important. But before I do that, just... A, a very beautiful lesson in what to look for in a daughter-in-law or obviously son-in-law. You know, it says that Eliezer came and he sees this unbelievable girl. And you know what the Midrash says? He was impressed because the water rose to her. Everybody knows that. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. The water rose to her. So obviously she is a very holy person. So the rabbis ask, once he sees that she's a holy rabbi, she's a holy person, that's it. Book the deal. Why does he have to go through the whole chesed experiment test to see if she's a bal chesed? And what's the obvious answer, ladies and gentlemen? That when it comes to shiduch, you could be the biggest tamit chacham, you could be the holiest person. But if you don't have good midot, I'm not interested in you marrying my son. Have a good day. The most important concept when it comes to marriage is to be a bal chesed. Water rising, water falling, knowing shas. You know, sitting and learning 24 hours, that doesn't do it for us. It has the person who's a Baal Chesed. Okay. Here's the question I want to ask you. And I think it's so important for today's world. Eliezer and the Shidduch system. Do you know that the Perek, the chapter of Eliezer going to find Rivka, is one of the longest Perek Prakim in the Torah? It's 67 Sukim, Samach Zayin. 67 psukim. And most of it, what's remarkable about the story is that the Torah repeats itself in full detail again and again. Eliezer keeps telling the story. They keep saying over. He tells Lavan and Bituel everything he said before. So what's the point in having such a long arichut? You know, there are so many other parts of the Torah that are short and we learn so much from it. Rabbi Yisach of France says something so nice. We need to understand that when it comes to a shiduch, sometimes maybe we have God's blessing and it happens quickly, but sometimes it takes 67 psukim to get it done. We have to be patient. And sometimes we have to tell the same story. This is the 35th girl that I went out with. The same story. Yeah, you got to repeat the same. How many times are you going to tell that funny joke to the next girl that you're going to take out? Yeah, you got to do it 67 times sometimes. That's the way it is. And you have to be patient. And you have to be, uh, you know, a little faith. 
And that's why the chapter of the Shiduch, the first chapter of Shiduch, is extremely long and is extremely repetitive. Very nice. Once I'm talking about Shiduchim, there's a great Gemara. The Gemara in Sanhedrin says, Kashe lezivugan kikriat yamsuf. It is hard to make zivugim as hard as it was to split the Red Sea. Shake your hand in your head. Have you ever heard of this Gemara? It's a very famous Gemara. That making a Shidduch is as difficult as Kriyat Yamsuf. So there's the simple Pshat, there's the funny Pshat, and there's the deeper Pshat. So we're going to go for all three. So the simple Pshat is, and it's so important again for Shiduchim, which is so upper, you know, up on, on people's minds, is when Bnei Israel were at Yamsuf, ladies and gentlemen, think, put yourself, picture yourself at Yamsuf. In back of them was the Egyptian army. In front of them was Yamsuf. You have to remember, Cecil B. DeMille didn't make the movie yet, The Ten Commandments. So they had no idea that that's what's going to happen. So what is their feeling at that point? I'm done. I'm stuck. I have nowhere to go. I can't go forward. I can't go backwards. I'm desperate. And then in desperation, Hashem did a miracle and he split the sea. Sometimes when people deal with Shiduchim, we get that feeling. Where am I going to go? I think I took out every girl in New York. That's it. It's over. So that's why I went to Toronto. But, okay, that was funny, Cookie. That was funny. Yes, but you, you know, you, you think you're desperate, and then all of a sudden, Hashem does a miracle. Isn't that a nice perush? Nice perush. The funny one. Okay, you might not like this one, but here it goes. Kriyat Yamsuf is the splitting of the sea. The truth is, you could probably split water also. Go ahead, fill up your tub, put your hand through the water, the water will split. What's the miracle of the splitting of the water? Is that the water stays split, because after you split it, it just comes back together automatically. So maybe the Gemara is saying, making a Shidduch is not that difficult. Keeping the Shidduch married, that's not so simple. So maybe that's Kashet Zibugan Shal Yisrael Kikriyat Yamsuf. Good. And the third Perush, and I like the most, and then we're out of Shidduchim, is this. This is so nice. The analogy between Zibugim and Yamsuf. Perhaps it can be suggested that Yamsuf had a special quality to it. Nachshon ben Aminadav jumped into the sea, following, followed by his tribe. Therefore, the initial cause of the miraculous splitting of the sea was man's leap of faith. It may be said with Shiduchim as well. Though Hashem is constantly involved in making Shiduchim, but once, once in a while, it says man, it means woman too, must at a certain point take a leap. Okay, this is a big one and this is hard. Which means that at some point in our life when it comes to Shiduchim, we need to take the leap. Nachshon ben Aminadav went into the sea when the sea was not split. He had the faith in Hashem. At some point, we have to say, okay, looks good, sounds good, I'm nervous, but you got to take that leap. Those are all the comparisons to Shaduchim. Everybody's good? Done. At the end of last week's Parsha, there's a very important pasuk. It's a pasuk you know, and it's something that you know what we learned from it. But this week, I found some very interesting insights. So stick with me. It's at the end of last week's pasuk uh, 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 chapter, I told you there was 67. This is pasuk 63 and 64. So everybody knows that Rivka agreed to come, and Rivka now is being brought from Haran to Kina'an, right? To meet to meet the guy she's going to marry. This is very famous, but I want to add stuff today. Yitzchak was in the field talking. It says pray, we'll get to pray. But he's talking, he's having a convo. Lifnot erev before the evening, in the afternoon. Vayisa'inav, raises his eyes, and he sees camels. I'll get to in a second. 
Vatisa Rivka at Einea, Rivka sees, and this is the first date between Yitzchak and Rivka. Vateret Yitzchak, and she meets her Bashar. It's a Basho. Vatipome Alagamal, what a great first date situation. And she falls off the camel. How awkward is that for a first date situation? I don't know. They married her anyway. By the way, even though I made a little joke here, a lot of rabbis look at this as a very important piece of info. I'm just going to touch it for a second and then go back to the main event. Many rabbis discuss the difference between Avram and Sarah's relationship and Yitzchak and Rivka's relationship. It's an interesting concept. Last week, we learned that when Sarah, two weeks, last week, that when Sarah was feeling that there's something wrong with Yishmael, what did she do? What did she do? What did Sarah do? She sat Avraham down. She said, Rabbi Avraham, let's have some coffee and cake. Let's discuss it. She clearly, openly discussed the issue with him. And it was not a simple conversation. Rivka did not do that this week. And we, we're going to discuss it a little later. Why not? But some people feel that Rivka's relationship was a little different because, Rif, first of all, there was a huge age gap. You guys know that. I don't want to touch the age gap because you're going to go crazy on me once I tell you the age gap. But there was an age gap between Yitzhak and Rivka. And second of all, look, when Rivka first came, she saw him. She was overwhelmed by his holiness. I mean, she saw him as a, a, a very, very holy, you know, spiritual person. So possibly that relationship was a little different. Okay, we'll get back to that later. Says the Gemara, Lasuach is Lashon Tefila. Fine. Interesting to me. Why are you using Lasuach? I don't know. I, maybe you tell me I'm being nitpicky. Why are you telling me Lasuach? I, and why do I have to know? What does Rashi have to tell me? You should know that Lasuach is Lashon Tefila because it says in Tehillim. Just say it. What is this like? You know, backwards? Say it. So, Let's put that in our little minds. And of course, why does it have to tell me that he was in the Sunday? So let's answer the second question first. Everybody knows the Gemara says that our sages attribute the origin of three day, uh, daily prayers to our patriarchs. Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Abraham created the prayer for Shachrit, and here we are. This is Mincha, because it says, Lifnot Erev, right? Lifnot Erev is the afternoon. So Yitzchak Davin Mincha, and that's how we know that we have to Davin Mincha. So now we understand, ladies and gentlemen, why it says Basadeh. Because what is unique about Mincha, other than every other prayer, Shacharit can be done in the morning before we leave, Mayrif can be done when we come home, but Mincha is always in the middle of the day. And how cool is it that we are now at a time that we move the clock, that Mincha is a challenge. Mincha is not an easy situation. By 4.15 today, we have to finish Mincha. So what do we got? Basadeh, that he had, it comes to teach us that even when you're in the Sadeh, the Sadeh basically represents you're out in the field, you're out at work, you're in the middle of doing something, and therefore it says Sadeh. Did not answer Lasuach yet, but we're going to do it right now. Which means that we now realize that Mincha, is a unique prayer. Of the three prayers, which one is the shortest? Mincha. Mincha is the easiest and fastest prayer. Yet, Mincha is the holiest prayer. How do I know that? I know it by the name, ladies and gentlemen. Shacharit is called Shacharit because of the morning. Arbit is called Erev because of Erev. So why are we calling Mincha Ben Harbayin, or Afternoon, or Tzoharayin? What is the word Mincha? What does the word Mincha mean? Anybody want to tell me what the word Mincha means? Nobody? Like Menucha. Menucha is nice. I like Menucha. Give me another one. A what? It's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. It is an active present, but I have to tell you, Peggy, it's also, I like that because the present means I'm settled. You understand? Menucha. So, but it is a gift. I'm sorry? Okay. I said oh, Korban. who said Korban? Who said Korban? Mosel. Mosel, like hang in there, hang in there, hang in there, okay. hang in there. So the rabbis yeah. tell us that it's a mincha, so it's a gift. So first of all, right away, we see, right away, we see 
that what? That, that mincha is special because it's called something special. So I want to take it a step further, Moselle, excellent. So not only is it a gift, watch carefully, but we're comparing it to a korban mincha, not because a korban mincha was brought at that time. Do you understand what I'm saying? It wasn't to a korban mincha. So let's take a look for a minute, ladies and gentlemen. What's special about korban mincha? So believe it or not, a korban mincha came from flour. Korban mincha came from solet. It was a meal offering. Who would bring a korban mincha? I'm going to stop sharing here for a second. A korban mincha was an option given to the person who had no money to give a korban. No money. A big korban was an animal, somebody who had a lot of possibility. A bird korban was the next level, but somebody who couldn't afford that and couldn't afford that brought a korban mincha because flour was cheap. Look what the Gemara, what the Torah says, not the Gemara. When they introduce a korban mincha, nefesh ki takriv korban mincha lashem. Doesn't say ish. Guys, this is fascinating how God writes the Torah. These every little words make a difference. Normally it says ish, ish, ki akriv. Not there. Nefesh ki takriv. Why does it say nefesh? Look at this gorgeous Rashi. Lo ne'emar nefesh bechol korbanot nedaba. It doesn't say soul in any of donated sacrifices, only in a mincha. Mi darko nader mincha. Who gives a korban mincha? An ani, a poor person. Can you look at this, please? Omar HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Ma'ale ani alav ki ilu hi kriv nafsho. A person who brings a poor piece of flour, but that's all he can afford, I account as though he sacrificed his very soul. I love this. Now let's go to our understanding of us sacrificing to Hashem. Ladies, it's not the sacrifice. It's where it's coming from. How much is the sacrifice? How beautiful is that? We make an appeal in shul and the millionaire gives a thousand dollars and a very poor man gives a dollar. But if that dollar is so, so difficult for that person in God's eyes, it's not the amount of the sacrifice. It's the part of the sacrifice. You guys with me? I would like therefore to offer that since Mincha is in the middle of the day, do you know why it didn't say Vayit Palel? It says, Lasuach, because it's mincha. God, I don't have that much time to have a full tefillah, a quick conversation, just a conversation. God says, you know what? Even if it's a minute conversation, but it's something the best you could do in the middle of the day, I'll take it. And I'll, I'll look at it as though you sacrifice something. Come on, tell me that's nice. It's new. Yeah, I hope you like that. Which means that's what the Torah, that's what God is saying. That's why it says sicha. It doesn't say it. I don't have time, God, for a long tefillah. But God says, I see it as a korban mincha. That's why it's called tefillah's mincha. Okay. I want to put another image in your mind that I love about this concept. You ready? So there's a pasuk in Breshit when Yaakov is blessing Yosef. And he's saying to Yosef, I'm dying. God should be with you. And he says to him, I'm giving you a bigger portion. I'm giving you the city of Shechem. Boy, who needs the city of Shechem today, right? What's in, what's in the city of Shechem today? We don't want it today. I know, terrorists. Yeah, I'm giving you the city of Shechem. Which I took, which I was able to conquer, I, I, I conquered it from the from the Emori. Once again, see how beautiful every word of the Torah is. I was able to conquer it with my sword and with my bow and arrow. Says Rashi, swords and bow and arrow are not literal. 
They are metaphors. Look at Rashi. Swords, bechokmato, in my cleverness. Why is a sword a metaphor for cleverness? Why? Because it's sharp, right? Sword is sharp. So if you're sharp minded, it's called a cherev. What's kashti? What's a bow and arrow? Tefilato. So a sword is a metaphor for wisdom. Got it. And a bow and arrow is a metaphor for prayer. Why is a bow and arrow a metaphor for prayer? Look how beautiful this is, guys. The Kotzka Rebbe, such a very wise rabbi, said that prayer is referred to as a bow. Why? Just as a bow. When one pulls a string of the bow only slightly further back, the arrow goes considerably further. So to prayer, the more intense, even if it's slightly more, the power, more powerful it is, and it's acknowledged. Oh, how beautiful is that? It's the same idea, the same effort. Guys, put this picture in your mind, right? Bow and arrow, Robin Hood. I don't know if anybody has a bow and arrow. The more you stretch it back, the harder it is to stretch that hard, 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 the further the tefillah goes. Isn't that a beautiful image, the Kutzka Rebbe? So the Kutzka Rebbe says that, again, it's the effort that's necessary in this tefillah that makes the tefillah the better tefillah. It's all the similar concept. So even if it's a small sicha, even if it's a little bit, it goes a long way. And that's what we learned from there. Okay, you know, I'm never finished with this. I got to tell you a story. Yay, a great story. Okay, this is a nice saying. Effort is one of these things that gives meaning to the effort. And very nice. Look at this story. I'm going to read it very quickly. Then we start with our next, next uh, parsha. A taxi driver in Arizona once said the following story to an American yeshiva student. I once gave the stifling gaon, the gaon ador, a ride in my taxi. The gaon asked me, do you set aside time for learning Torah? Do you learn Gemara? I told him the truth, said the sack taxi driver. I'm exhausted when I come home from a long day of driving. But after supper, I go to a Gemara shear in the neighborhood. The nightly shear is one hour long, but inevitably after five minutes, I fall asleep and I am only woken 55 minutes later by the sound of the Magid shear teacher closing his Gemara. That is the end of the shear. I pick up about five minutes worth of Gemara study every night. The stipler responded by quoting the above pasuk, the one we just learned, that when a soul shall bring a meal offering, a nefesh should bring a meal offering. The stipler said, this taxi driver is giving all that he can. The fact that he falls asleep every single night by the Gemara after five minutes is due to the fact that he is dead tired. But he makes an effort to come to the shear and is giving all that he can give. Giving all that one can give is all the Almighty asks for. Can you imagine? So now all of us, when we come to shul, do not feel guilty that you fall asleep when the rabbi gives a class. Please do not feel guilty. I'm sure you know the old story, right? That the rabbi gets a call from his congregant at three in the morning, and the congregant is say, Rabbi Besser, can you give me five minutes of your Wednesday class? I go, wow, that's so nice. What's the matter? He goes, I'll tell you the truth. Every time you start speaking, I fall asleep. I can't sleep tonight. Just start the class and boom, it'll work really well for me. Yeah, okay. But now you don't have to feel guilty. I must just end this part with a very famous Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, may you rest in peace, addition. It's so beautiful. So we talked about the three tefillot, shachrit, mincha, and arbi, that mincha being at the middle of the day is the most, right, is the most uh, challenging and therefore the biggest. Lubavitcher Rebbe, that we have to said to compare those three tefillot to three stages in a person's life. Shachrit are the younger years, Arbit are the older years, and Mincha are the middle years. When a person is committed to Torah values when they're in the younger years, it's very nice. But he's in younger years, he's controlled by his school, he's controlled by his parents, you know. When a person is committed to Torah values when he is an older Oh, from now on, I'll only eat kosher. You can't even eat meat anymore. You're 98. Okay, so what's the point, right? So it's nice, but it's not such a big commitment. The main commitment is when a person is in the strength of his life, you know, he has the ability to steer off and he doesn't. That's something very special. That's a little bit of Very nice. Okay. This week's Parsha is told out. So Rivka and Yitzchak get married. 
has no children for 20 years. She prays. I'm, I'm jumping because I want to get to something very big today. And she becomes pregnant. And boy, does she become pregnant, right? She becomes pregnant. She has pains. And we know that every time she walks by a shul, she gets a kick. Every time she walks by a disco joint, that's how our Rebbe used to call it in those days. She went to shul and a disco joint. Okay. Uh, she has a kick. She doesn't know what's going on. Does she have a split personality kid? You know, does she have a kid who, you know, is half, uh, he's like a tuna bagel? Like what kind of kid does she have? So she goes to the Navi and the Navi says, you're having two children. And what is this? And what is that? And that makes sense. Okay. Everybody's got it. A quick line that I always say is a nice lesson. I didn't even write it down. It just came into my head now. The rabbis ask a really nice question on two conflicting midrashim. So one midrash says that the babies wanted to leave to go to its own place, right? This to the disco joint and this to the yeshiva. So you know there's another midrash. Everybody knows this midrash. You don't, can't see it because I have a mustache. Or you can't see anything because all my hair left. But here, right under my nose, you all have this under your nose. What is that? Why is it there? Anybody remember? You know, come on. Right. So, everybody, yes, yes, Peggy, very good. Thank you for the visual effect. Yes, yes, which is that a malach sits and learns with us in our, right, in the womb. And then, right before we're born, he touches us and then we forget everything. Okay. That's not so difficult for me to accept because I have no memory of what I learned yesterday. So, I'm sure him, you know, making me forget everything I learned was very easy. The conflicting midrash, which is so cute, this is a nice question. You should teach this to your children is if it's true that a malach is sitting and learning with Yaakov in the mother's womb, I got it that Asab wanted to leave, right? Because Asab wasn't happy learning Torah. He wanted to go to the disco. But why did Yaakov want to leave? He's sitting as the best Rebbe, the best thing. Why is he leaving, right? Everybody got the question? Yeah? Yes. And the answer, of course, is that you could be in the best yeshiva, and the best Rebbe, but if you're sitting next to somebody who's a bad influence, you got to get out. It's a nice lesson. Which means as good as a yeshiva is, as good as a rabbi is, the most important thing is the influence your child's friends are on them. Okay, now that I scared everybody about your child's education and development, okay, I'm very excited. Let's move on. But I'm sure your kids have the best friends. Okay, I got to get to my main event. There's a main event today. Nobody's leaving to my main event. Okay, here we go. Okay, so they're born. I want to talk a little bit about my favorite, favorite personality in the Torah. You know who my favorite personality in the Torah is? Esau. Because I don't think we understand him well. First, let's start. He's born. He's all red. Uh oh, Admoni. He's a little bit of a, of a gingy redhead. Kader Seyar is very hairy. And they call them Esav. And then Yaakov comes out. Yado ochezed ba'akev Esav. Vayikrashmo Yaakov. Is there anything inherent in that word Esav? What is the word Esav about? So you might not be happy because you're going to say if they called him that when he was born, the kid never had a chance. That's a great question. We'll talk about it hopefully today. If not, I'm going to do this fast because I want to get to another part. You know why he was called Esav? Here, let me do this a little bit. The inability, yeah, the name Esav has the same letters and basic meaning as the Hebrew word Asui, done, hairy, completed, which means Esav was at peace with himself and did not feel the need to have, you know, to have an improvement. The realization that one is not perfect and must improve was not in his vocab. I'm good. You can't change me. The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. How good is that line? Can I say that again? The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement, which means Aesop's personality is a challenge in life. Okay. People who don't do well by needing to grow and improve themselves is not a Jewish trait. A malach is an omed, an adam is a holech. The rabbis tell us that our existence in this world is like being on a ladder. You're either going up or you're going down. And up is the way to go. Which means Esav was the antithesis 
of self-improvement. As compared to Yaakov, right? As compared to Yaakov, who was Yado Ochezet Ba'akev Esav, his hand was holding the other person's heel. His, he sees himself as somebody who needs to continuously climb and self-improvement and self-criticism. So it's very important to understand those are the qualities that we have to avoid. A person saying, nah, not, not, ladies and gentlemen, don't get me wrong. Not only should a person not say, I don't need to be better, Asav, and I'm going to prove it today. You're not leaving until I prove it. Asav felt you can't. I, 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 I'm not. This is me. This is me. I'm sorry. You can't change. I can't change. I can't change. I'll show you what it means soon. Okay. Before I go into the big proof that's going to take the rest of the class, I have to tell you a, an unbelievable analogy that we had this, this week. We had a senior program, and I'm going to give him credit. I hope somebody will say that I mentioned his name. Nathan Dweck, Erica's husband. Of course, all husbands are just known by who their wife is. I don't know. That's Davar Yadua. Nathan Dweck spoke for me. I mean, he spoke to my senior boys. He's a great speaker. And Nathan, besides being a brilliant speaker, has all these sports analogies in his fingertips because he's a sports guy, unlike me. And in this concept of self-improvement, I have to tell you his story that he told the seniors, and it was so precious. So, Cookie, I think I told it to you. It was so precious. I want you to listen. It's a real story. He tells a story about a NCAA, that's a basketball tournament, very competitive, a couple of years ago, college. And this team was, you know, going to play the championship game. And one of the players on the team was not a top player. He was third string. There were 45 seconds left. And I'm sorry, in the last quarter, three of the five players, if you know basketball, ladies and gentlemen, fouled out. That means they couldn't play anymore in the game. So this guy was put into the game. 45 seconds left at the game. They're down by one. They need to make the play to win the game. Very competitive for the championship. The coach is telling the team what the play is going to be. And of course, he's telling this guy who's not so good, you're not in the play. Just stand there. You know, just be wallpaper. Zag is in. And the play is with the other players. They go back into the court. The play begins. And clock is ticking down. And the, the play is not successful. Not successful. 10, 9, 8, whatever. The ball ends up in this guy's hand. Five seconds left to the game. He pumps, shoots, swish. Gets it in. Great shot. Wins the championship. I'm going to cut to the chase. He made it much longer. After the game, interviewed him with somebody else. How did he do it? Listen to what he said. They said, how'd you do it? All that pressure. He said, you know, the night, last night, the night before the game, I was on my bed dreaming about this possibility. How would it be if the ball comes to me and I win the game? He said, I did it so many times last night in my bed that when it actually happened, it was easy because I did it already. How brilliant is that? How brilliant is that? That's what self-improvement means. Self-improvement means with a vision. You know, you get up and you say, I can see myself doing that. I can fix that. That's part of the opposite of Esau. Esau says, nah, I can't. Yaakov says, let's grow. Okay. That was a nice analogy, right? It wasn't mine. It's Nathan. Everybody, don't forget to text Erica to say that I mentioned her husband's name. Okay. Rabbi. Ready? Yes. Weren't the, uh, wasn't Esau born with this um, similar or the same attributes as David Amela? Yes, so that's another right. issue. Yeah, Marcel, I won't. For sure, I'm not touching your family because that's redheads. <laughs> We're gentry, yes. Yeah, oh, Marcel, you're the, you should not have asked that question, Marcel. Okay, so I will, you know, I will tell you the lesson, Marcel. I wasn't going to, but I'm going to. Which means people have certain attributes and it's our job to take those attributes, you understand, and channel them into the right direction. The attribute you're referring to is a blood concept. It is. Not all gingies. So David Melech developed the ability to be a warrior. As, 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 as humble as he was and as soft as he was, he was a warrior. But a warrior for the right thing. You with me? 
where a sav made it into self, you know, ritzicha and, and being a bully. I'll give you a good, I'll give you a great example, if I may. Guys, ready? Sense of humor, right? Being able to say something funny. I think that's a gift, right? I know certain rabbis who have that gift. So a sense of humor. So a person can use that sense of humor to hurt other people, right? Right? To make fun of other people, to make jokes about other people. And a person can use that, right, in order to. I'll give you a third example. God made certain people ADD. I'm one of them. So what am I doing with my ADD? I'm making kids crazy in school. That's a good thing, right? Or or do you make trouble? So everybody's got their gifts and attributes. Good, Mosel. Okay, guys. Okay, okay. because of Mosel, we have to go over time. No, it's okay, Mosel. Here we go. You ready? I want to show you something amazing, and you can't leave. Uh, this is my favorite piece of all time. Hang in there. I'm going to skip one part, but here we go. Okay, so they're born. This pasuk is probably one of the most difficult sukim to understand in behavior of the avot. Vayehav Yitzchak et Esav. Yitzchak loves Esav. Ki sayid befiv. Because he puts chicken in his mouth. Verivka ohevet et Yaakov. Okay. What is going on here? Okay, so first of all, does that mean that Yitzchak didn't love Yaakov? No, go like this. No, 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 we're not going to say that. That doesn't mean he hated Yaakov. It means that he loved Esau. Rivka loves Yaakov. Okay, we'll get to Rivka. I don't know if I'll get to Rivka today. If not, believe neither next week. Can I deal with Yitzchak? Okay, so as Esau is growing up, we learn that he is a bully, we learn that he likes to hunt. We learn that he does things that are not so nice. He's not in yeshiva. He's in the streets. He's hanging out. He's smoking up. Okay? And the Torah tells us that Yitzhak loves him. So you're going to tell me, what's wrong with that? Yitzhak's trying to be nice to him, right? Yitzhak's trying to love him, like we said, Abraham and Yishmael. Okay, I'll take it. But the Torah tells us a reason, guys. <laughs> what's the reason? He loves Esav because he's a good hunter and he makes a great barbecue chicken. You got to be kidding. That's the reason he loves Yitzhak? Yitzhak loves Esav? Because he feeds him well? Anybody want to accept that? Don't raise your hand. Please do not raise your hand. That's insane. Some people learn the way Rashi learns. Let's start with Rashi. Let's respect Rashi. Rashi says, Said means hunting, but it's much deeper. Watch. Says Rashi, on the spot, Kitar Gumo, Befiv Shal Yitzchak, Medrasho, Shaya Tzad Oto Umiramehu Bidvarav. The Midrashic interpretation is, with Esav's mouth, he would entrap him and deceive him with his words. Esav was a faker. When he came into Yitzchak's tent, he put on his talis and he put on his strimal and he made believe, yo, yo, tati. He trapped him. He entrapped him. You understand? Not that he gave him food. He entrapped him. And that's what a lot of rabbis learn. Okay. Rabbi Besser, love Rashi. It's not his fault. It's a midrash. I have a lot of trouble with this. Because that means, what is the picture we have of Yitzchak? A very naive individual, correct? Come on, guys. Right? That's what it sounds like. He's a naive guy. The guy is a faker. Can't you see it? So some, some rabbis learn, yeah, Yitzchak was brought up in whose house? Avraham. <laughs> the guy was like straight as an arrow. He doesn't know what a fake is. Rivka was brought up in Lavan's house. Oh, she knows how to catch a, a faker. Okay. It still bothered me. It bothered me. So I have two other pedush, and we're going to go a little over time. Five minutes. Okay, listen up. The first pedush is I'm going to go back to the food. Yeah, it's because of the food. Come on, Bessa, are you kidding? No, 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 no. Watch. 
So the Gemara says something that everybody here knows, because I've said it a thousand times. We are actually told early in the project that Yitzhak loved Yitzhak, right? Because he hunted. It's strange that he should love Esau food, right? Hazal see that Yitzchak loved Esav not because he enjoyed his food, but because Esav was so zealous in kibud av va'em. The Medrash tells us that Rabbi Gamliel said, all my days I served my father and I didn't accomplish even one one hundredth of the degree to which Esav honored his father. When Esav served his father, he served him wearing royal garments. There was a mitzvah that Esav was perfect in. It was the mitzvah of kibud av. I don't know about the end part, but kibud av for sure. And the Gemara says, Rabbi Gamliel says, I don't come to one one hundredth. I have a lot to say about that, maybe next week, but I got to get to the next part. Which means, listen to what I want to say. He was good at hunting. That was he was good at. Yitzchak made him feel that he loved every food that he hunted because he found something in Esav that he was good at. Everybody's born with different things. Esav was not the Yaakov. Esav was not the student. He was not the valedictorian, but he was good at hunting. So Yitzchak made him feel, I love you because you honor me so much with that hunting. And he did honor him. By the way, just a side joke, you should know, I always say, he used to wear special garments when he walked into Esav, into Yitzchak's room. You know why was, that was amazing? Because at the end of Yitzchak's life, Yitzchak was, Yitzchak was blind. Yitzchak didn't even know that's how kind of level Esav was on. And I want to show you, even though we're running late, I have to show you. You know what he's teaching us? Something that we say, I'm going to skip this part. There's a Gemara Baba Basha tells us that there was a near-death encounter. Rabbi Yosef, the son of Rabbi Yeshua, was dead. I don't know what that means, but whatever it is, for a short period of time. When he was resuscitated, his father's question, what, what did you see in Olam Abba? He said, I saw an Olam Hafuch, an upside-down world. High people were low, and low people were high. What does that mean? The father said, you see a clear world. Listen carefully, ladies and gentlemen, especially parents. His father explained that what he saw, a clear world, Hashem only demands from a person that which is within the individual's person's ability. Those with lesser abilities and more modest potential are not expected to accomplish as much as others. If they maximize their potentials to fulfill the purpose for which they were sent to the world, even if they accomplish less, Masim Tovim, studying less Torah, they are the top. Those high people might have accomplished more. No, no, no. Do you understand what it's saying here? If somebody comes to a person and says, you know, you never walked to shul. But he never walked to shul because he never had the power to walk. He had polio. You can't expect somebody who can't walk to walk to shul. And therefore, just because another person walked to shul a million times in their life and he didn't, that means nothing. Maybe the guy in the wheelchair who wheeled himself to shul once in 10 years, that was higher than the guy who walked. So the olama fuch, the world is upside down. You can't, you can't make those decisions. A guy who learns one daf gemara, it took him 10 years, maybe that daf is bigger than the genius who finished Shas. Are you guys following? Or maybe I'm, yes? I want to say that Yitzchak understood this concept. Of course he loved Yaakov. But Esav was not Yaakov. He was not as good. He didn't have that attribute. So what did Yitzchak do? He found the attribute that was given to him, and he made it into a mitzvah by love, and that made Esau great. No? No good? Like it? Good. That's what Yitzchak did. That was his goal. That was his goal. Now, we're going to do this in seven minutes. Oh, my gosh. But it didn't work. It didn't work. I'm going to give you, this is one of my favorite pieces. I'm going to give you a piece that happened this week. I'm going to throw you eight questions. And with one word, I'm going to answer all eight questions. And now I'm going to tell you what was the downfall of Asaf, And it saddens me because it's, 
it, it has a lot to do with our world today. Here we go. You know the story. By Yazid Yaakov Nazid. Yaakov is, is cooking soup. Okay. So, of course, the first question is, what is he, the galloping gourmet? Why is Yaakov cooking soup? What is that? Okay. He's cooking soup. Good. Esav comes home from the Sadeh. He's Ayev. That's already one question. Why is he cooking soup? By Yom Esav Yaakov. Yaakov, Esav tells the Yaakov. If you never heard this from me, please listen carefully because it's really sharp. Halitainina, please give me. Mina adom adom azet. From this red red, ki ayef anochi, because I am tired, alkein karashimo edom. Therefore, Esav's name was Edom. Okay, are you ready? One bomb question after the other. First of all, what does na mean? Please. Yeah? Really? That's how Esav is talking to his younger brother, Yaakov. Esav doesn't say please. Okay? Doesn't make sense. Give me from the red, red, from the red, red, uh, that Asaph stutter also with all those other things. How about just from the red, right? <laughs> or why just call it soup? Why is he calling it red, red? Okay, two questions. Next, give me the soup because I am, what's the next word? How about hungry? Give me the soup because I am hungry. Give me the bed because I am tired. Come on, guys. Third grade English. Finish the sentence. Are you guys following? Therefore, he is known as Edom. Are you kidding me? Okay, his name is Esav. Got it. All of a sudden, he gets a new name in the Chumash. And he's known like that, Edom. Why? Because that one morning, he called the soup. I want the red soup. Now he's called Edom because he said, what's the red soup? Now you're calling him, hello, red? Come on, guys. That doesn't make sense to me. We're not done. We're not done. None of this makes sense. Yaakov says, sell me your Bechorah. Why all of a sudden today? All of a sudden Yaakov wakes up. He's, 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 he's in soup mode and he goes, sell me the Bechorah now? Why now? Why not yesterday? Why not the day afterwards? I think we're up to six questions now. I'm going to die. Okay, I don't understand that either. Seven questions. This is not like a kid in high school going... No, Rabbi, don't give us a test. We're going to die. You know, what is, I'm going to die. He's not going to die. He's hungry. Okay. Okay. I don't know what number I'm up to. Uh, yeah. Lamed Gimel. My Yomi Yaakov, Yishab Ali, swear to me. Okay, he swears. Okay, I have a question here too, but if I have time, I'll do it. If not, not. Okay. All those questions. So first, let's start by our first question. Everybody knows the answer to this question. Why is Yaakov? But I have to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. This question is going to, this answer is going to produce an eighth question. Ready? What was Yaakov cooking? Why is he cooking? So everybody knows. He was cooking. Salah died. Adashim. Yeah. Adashim. Lentil. Lentil, Lentil soup. Why was he cooking? Lentil soup because Oto Hayom met Abraham. Oh. Abraham. Yitzchak is sitting Shiva. Fascinating concept that the same custom that we have of giving uh, mourners, right? We give mourners, when they come back from the funeral, we give them an egg, we give them a bagel, we give them something round, because to remember that the cycle of life, this minhag is thousands of years old. As a matter of fact, am I right in the Sephardic community, uh, adashim, right? Lentil soup is known as mourner soup. Am I correct? I'm almost sure. Yes. Oh, so now we answered our first question. Our first question was, why was he cooking soup? He was doing the mitzvah of bringing the lentils to his father, Yitzchak, who was sitting. But now produces my eighth question. What color is lentils, ladies? Lentil soup, what color is it? Brown. It's Brown. It's not red. Yeah. <laughs> He's making a big deal of it being red, and it's not even red. It's brown. Okay. Let's answer another one of our questions. People often begin to think about life precisely the time of mourning and death. That is when people think of death's inevitability. Okay, so I'd like to offer, why did Yaakov now wake up that he needed to make a move about this Bechora? Because Avraham died, you understand, guys? And therefore, it had an impact on, on Yaakov. He goes, oh my gosh, Avraham died, grandpa died, my father Yitzhak, right, is the next in line. Who's in line after him? So that motivated him to make a move about the Bechora. Fair? Good answer. But what about all our other questions? I want to show you how an, one word makes a difference. I asked you, not means please. 
So everybody knows it's very famous. I will show you a, a pasuk in Shemot that na does not mean please. You have to eat the korban Pesach, the night of Pesach. Sli'ish has to be roasted. Matzah and Mara. Very exciting. Look at this. Al tochlu mimenu na. Do not eat it raw, rare. It has to be cooked or, or cooked. You can't cook. You can't cook the korban Pesach. It has to be roasted. So the word na has two meanings. It could mean please and it could mean raw. Whoa, everybody look back. Everybody look back. Let's go back. Esav comes home and he says, Haliteni na. Doesn't say, please give me the soup now, raw. Min ha'adom ha'adom hazeh. Why is he saying it's red? Because the lentils in the first well. stage are red. They didn't turn brown yet. And therefore, he says the red, red. Why? Kiayef, I'm not. I need it now. I need it now. Alkain kara shemo edo. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you watch the news about the rate of death and suicide because of drugs and alcohol in our community. It's called an addiction. Asav was a very nice boy, but he was an addict. What is an addict? An addict is up to a point that he can't even wait two minutes for the soup to cook. Akain kara shemo edom. They called him edom. That was his personality. Yes, he had a mitzvah, but he was an addict. He couldn't help himself. And once a person is an addiction, you can't help that person. Are you guys following? So I would like to offer the following perush. Yitzhak, we know why he loved him. We got it. But Kitsayid Befiv is telling us that poor Asab. that's why I feel bad. Asab was a good kid. He wanted to do Kibbut Abba'em. He wanted to do mitzvot. And when, when he went to his father's house, he was a good person. But then he was an addiction person. He couldn't help himself. And therefore, he fooled himself. So Yitzchak did love him because Yitzchak saw the sincerity. But then all of a sudden, the guy hits an addict. Guys, I, I, I'm running out of time, but we know stories about children who go off, 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 off. I don't even talk about off the derech, off life, Who's, who they come home and they cry that they want to be good. Okay, I'm going to say something, and maybe I shouldn't. You know, there are stories about husband or wife were not nice to each other physically, right? That, that they, sometimes they lose, they lose themselves. But when they don't lose themselves, they, they show that they really love the other person. But then they're lost. They're, they're addicted. They're addicted to a certain behavior that they can't help themselves. How sad is that? So that's what I believe. And therefore he said, because what is an addict's concept? You know what? I, I, that's it. I can't even think about it. I'm going to die. I got to have my fix now. And that's the story of Asaf. And that's a big story. You guys following? And I want to back it up with two proofs. And then I'm done, even though I have more stuff, but I want to show you two proofs. This is one of my favorite proofs of all time. Okay, I'm skipping all the other stuff. I don't have time right now. I'll get back to it maybe next week. Okay, I want you to see some. Look at, look at these, by, by the way, look at these sayings. I'm not addicted to alcohol or drugs. I'm addicted to escaping reality, which is the truth. That's an addict. We can easily forgive a child. Guys, can look at this saying. It's so beautiful. We can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. It's a great saying. Okay. Two proofs. You ready? Avraham did not want his children to marry Kenani girls. Right? Right? Go like this. Right? That's why he went all the way to Haran. Yitzchak and Rivka did not want to marry Kenani girls either. And that's why eventually Yaakov went all the way to Haran to get Rachel. What did Esav do? He married Kanani girls. He did. He married Kanani girls because he had an addiction. He liked whatever, like, like he liked food, you like whatever you like. You got it? What am I trying to teach? In Esav's mind, he's conflicted between Kibur and he really does love Yitzhak. 
He does. And he wants to be a good. And his addiction. You got to see this. This is crazy. After Yaakov, this is this week's question. After Yaakov runs away, runs away because Esau is going to kill him. And he heard his father, Yitzhak and Rivka, tell Yaakov, marry a non kanani girl. Look what it says. This is not Medrash. It's in the Torah. Vayar Esav kiraot binot kinan be'ene Yitzhak Avid. Say it with me. And Esav saw that the daughters of Canaan were displeasing to his father. Esav saw means that he's now back to his sensitivity. Oh my gosh, look, I married Canaanite girls and it's bothering daddy. It's bothering daddy. And, and so he has this moment of clarity that he's got to be a good boy. So what does he do? Vayelech Esav al Yishmael. Esav goes to Yishmael because Yishmael is what? He's family. He's family, right? Vayikach et machlat. We could talk about that, why she called machlat, but that's not now. And he took machlat, bat Yishmael ben Avraham. Beautiful, right? Beautiful. So all of a sudden, Esau's a little older. He understands. He's tapping into the, 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 the warm feeling that he has for his father, right? He's upset about, uh, you know, he doesn't want to make his, his father upset. You know what? I'm really going to be good now. I'm really going to be good now. I'm going to get rid of my other women and only a Jewish girl. Yeah? Look at the Chumash. Ready? Vayelech, Vayikat et Machlat, right? Al Nashav. Al Nashav. Lo Risha, says Rashi. Hosif Risha al Rishato. He got even worse. Shalogi Reshet al Rishonot. You got it? Which means... If you really love your father, do the right thing. So it's a person coming in with his, you know, with his, with his, alco- with, with his drink, right? He's an alcoholic. Honey, I'm going to be straight. I love you, right? I'm going to put this bottle down for five minutes. <laughs> That's the confliction. I, I, I have to tell you, I, I, I empathize <laughs> with people like Asaf. I think, okay, I'm going to say something. I'm going to get killed on this. So I think there's a little piece of Esau in all of us. I really do. I think we all have that conflict. We all have that conflict that we really, really want to be good. We really don't want to speak Lashon Hara, but you know, you know that. We really don't want to do this. Blah, 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 blah. We have that conflict. And just to tap this, just to cap it all, which I always say, and I, I really have to leave because I have PTA. I just <clears throat> cap it off. There's a crazy Medrash. You know the Medrash. Rifka Khan will tell you the Medrash because she's been there a lot. Hi, Rivka. So, what's the Midrash? Who's buried in Hebron? Avram, uh, Adam Bechava, Yitzchak, right? Avram Bessara, Yitzchak, Rivka, Yaakov, and Leah. Come on, what's the Midrash? Come on, every kid knows this Midrash. What Aesop's, else is buried? Aesop's head. Aesop's head is buried there. We know the story that he came, he wanted to stop. Okay, whether you go with this Midrash or not, that's the Midrash. Do you know why? You know what the lesson is? Because Asaph's head was pure, ladies and gentlemen. It was real. He really meant it. And that's why Yitzchak loved him. So his head was pure. It was in the right place. He just couldn't internalize it. He couldn't self-control himself. So for him to be buried there, it's inappropriate. But for his head to be buried there, that's where it belongs. And our job is to take what we have in our heads and to internalize it. Okay, guys, I really got to go. 